And we're going to start with Michelle Howey from Telstra Dev. So Michelle is a developer advocate of Telstra Dev, she's, which is Telstra's API and IoT marketplace. There, she leads the engagement with the external developer community. As a tech evangelist, she drives awareness and adoption of emerging technologies like 5G, IoT, VR, AR, mobile commuting, computing, and AI. Based in Adelaide, Michelle is also a global shaper, hackathon hustler, and podcast host. She has a passion for global connectivity and an enthusiasm for technology as an enabler. And Michelle is going to talk to us all about low power, high performance, easy access IoT networks. So over to you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. And uh, thanks everyone for joining in to our session today. You can already see a few people in there. And I'd love to hear uh, in the chat um, where you're dialing in from today and yeah, what your interest is in the Internet of Things, which is great. Um, so yes, I'm here to speak about exactly what it says on the screen. Um, and it's so great to be here at API Days going virtual this year. Um, as Dan said, I'm coming from Adelaide on Ghana land. And over the next 20 minutes, I'll be diving into IoT from a network engineering lens in the platform side. So this session is for anyone and everyone um, with an interest in IoT, whether you're already an expert or you're hearing about it for the first time. Uh, no judgment. And uh, any questions you have during the presentation, pop them in the chat feature. I have my colleague Andrew here who will help with that. And then Dan and I will go through the questions at the end. I also welcome you to jump on Twitter and follow Telstra Dev, that's our handle, and me, Michelle Timin here, so we can stay connected. Um, so I'll get, I'm going to give you a summary of the entire presentation in just this slide, just in case you're short of time. So the Internet of Things is connecting the billions of devices to the network, which is providing a tsunami of data across almost every industry vertical. But not all IoT networks are created equal. So if you have low power requirements, i.e. you've got uh, like low battery or low cost requirements, you're going to be looking into the LP WAN, so the low power wide area networks. Um, like NBIoT and LTEM. But for high performance, you know, mission critical applications where um, yeah, you need that little bit extra, you're going to need the 5G network. And to make those IoT networks easier to access, control, and to actually manage the data insights from that ecosystem, we're going to secure that through APIs. So that's it. That's the whole presentation. Um, if you want to know more, though, uh, let's get into it. So there's actually already more IoT devices than people in the world, and that is set to increase fivefold in the next five years, at least. I think that's underestimating a little bit. And the IoT is about connecting data, analyzing that data, and then using those insights to automate systems to solve problems. And it makes sense to use IoT technology where the activity is too dull, too dirty, too dangerous, or too distant for human workers. Now, they're the four Ds of robotics I got from CSIRO, but I think they're really relevant here in IoT as well. And I guess there's lots of reasons why you wouldn't want to connect something to the internet, but a couple of reasons that you would, and that people are definitely using already, is to save energy, so saving resources, saving time, saving money, of course, and also to be safer and more entertaining. And this is going to impact us all on an individual level, whether it's reducing our electricity bill with automatic lights that dim when no one's there or alerting you when your plants need watering, which I definitely need. Um, but on an industrial level, on a bigger scale, you know, think of all the lights that are in a city, let alone in your home. Think of all the lights that are in a country and the resources that could be saved when we're really optimizing those things through by that connectivity and not to mention the lives that could be saved. It's all very exciting. So here's a fun example when IoT is paired with some contextual data. So this shopper could be wearing AR glasses, augmented reality glasses, that change the advertisements they see on different products depending on the demographic. So you can see this yogurt is um, targeting at a boy and a girl in the same, you know, the same situation. It's pretty scary stuff. Um, but for a real life example in football, we already have the Telstra trackers, which actually we have some IoT sensors sewn into the Guernseys of all the AFL players on the on the field. Um, and you can actually you know, bring in lots of information and you can take bets on who's the fastest runner in the league, um, who ran the most distance over the season. Um, so it's cool for engaging an audience, but it's also really cool for the coaches too. And they don't need to be engineers or IoT experts to make sense of this data if it's actually um, brought out and used efficiently. So we're here to talk about the platform, how the IoT is actually connected. And it's made up of three key things that I'll talk about. 
it's the physical devices, it's the network connectivity, and it's the platform and applications that sort of underpin it, right? And these devices on the Internet of Things could be anything, right? It could be a virtual reality headset, you know, playing a gigabyte a day of immersive education experiences or just playing games. Um, it could be a robot that's sending a few uh, megabytes every week, you know, to update the user. Um, it could be you know, a watering can, you know, that's sending a few kilobits every month to know how full it is. And you're going to actually need a different mobile network for each of those. So that's where you need the network. It could be a signal over you know, Wi-Fi, 5G, Bluetooth, Sigfox, um, whatever fits your application. And I'll talk about which application fits which network in a minute. And we also need the applications on top of that to actually you know, make sense of that data that's coming through and actually send information back to those devices so they can actually do something with it, right? Like release more water into the watering can or have the robot move to a, a certain place on the on the floor. So I'm going to be going through two very specific example use cases, and then I'm going to dive into the most relevant network technology that I would recommend to enable them. So one of the most impactful examples that I've seen in IoT deployment space recently is um, with this company who faces significant weather-related delays in their su supply chain. So imagine if you're traveling from the mines in the center of Australia to seaports where your precious loads are dropped off, right? And you have to travel thousands of kilometers from the middle of Australia to the sea by train. And when these tracks get hot, you know, in the order of 60 degrees in some places, the tracks actually start to warp and you have to drive slower in order to stay safer. So you have to guess based off of nearby weather forecasts what conditions uh, that's actually going to cause the tracks to pass a safe threshold. So you want to slow down, right? But every 10 kilometers per hour you cut off in speed, you lose potentially hours of time and the cost of that delay really adds up. But what if we could tell you with certainty, not the ambient temperature from a weather station 100 kilometers away, but how hot the track actually is at that exact point. So you would risk reduce the risk of undershooting and missing your delivery deadlines or overshooting and derailing. So it's just a few well-placed temperature sensors, for example, and a smart dashboard in the driver's seat that actually takes information from those sensors and makes sense of it for a driver, um, that's where it's going to make a big difference. So these kind of examples, so, we, you know, we're out in the outback, we're traveling thousands of kilometers, um, or we need data in, you know, near real time. You're going to really want devices and systems that have low power consumption, right? This is not like a phone that you can charge every single day. Um, well, I charge my phone multiple times a day because I use it so much. Um, but you don't want to be going out in the bush, you know, across this whole track to charge sensors every few days, right? So you want lower power consumption. Um, and that often means, you know, you make the devices dumber. So you're not going to have a touch screen. You're not going to have all these, you know, bells and whistles. It's going to be very basic, which means that it also reduces the cost. So lower complexity devices, you know, you're offloading the smarts somewhere else, lower cost devices. And you want those lower cost devices because the scale is in the hundreds and potentially the thousands if you're um, tracking other things as well. The third important thing for this use case is you need high geographical coverage because you're in areas where there might not be 3G, let alone 5G out here. So you're willing to sacrifice a fancy screen and complex features so that you can actually um, get connectivity to that device further away from the nearest mobile tower. So what's the network that I would recommend for these kind of use cases? Uh, that's the low power wide area network. So specifically NB IoT and CAT M1, also known as LTM. And the exciting thing about these networks um, is the trade-off because having low data requirements, so you know, having to descend just the temperature every hour or so, means you can have lower power, power use and go for longer distances. Um, distance that these uh, devices actually go is up to 120 kilometers away from the nearest tower, uh, which is great for rural and regional areas, of course, but think about in urban environments where you want minimal maintenance disruptions, like you don't want to be, um, you know, putting new cables across every single pit and, and light sensor in your city. Um, and you don't want to be having to put in wires underground and you know, dig up roads in the Melbourne CBD and then change factories underneath those. So um, as well as having long coverage, these actually have deep coverages as well. Um, and it really is set and forget. You know, you can monitor them remotely um, via APIs, right? Um, you can send firmware over the air, software updates, and all those things that make it easier um, from... I guess, a user perspective. You know, you're outsourcing all of that um, to the network. 
So the second example I want to give, you know, I'm sure when you see this, you can think of a thousand use cases for all these handy little drones. Um, Amazon released last week that they're starting, I think, door-to-door -door delivery with drones, which is going to be pretty interesting. Um, but Telstra uses drones a lot in emergency services, so things like bushfires where people can't go, um, and it's surf rescue, so actually flying out over over the sea to see um, if there's someone in trouble and drop down a life vest from the drone, right? Um, but the mission critical nature of these kind of deployments means there's a low latency requirement or the time it takes for data to be sent and received. It must be really low or i.e. really fast um, to start avoiding objects to course correct and to respond uh, in, in near real time, right? So these drones also need to be in light. So all of the processing for any ultra HD video footage needs to be done remotely, ideally in nearby edge compute, um, so we're going to need high data rates to be able to send all that data from the video of the drone down to a compute that's on the ground. Being so high, moving so fast, these drones actually need ultra HD, so like 4K, 8K video, which you can't get on a uh, low data rate on a low throughput network. Remembering that in areas like this, it's all happening in urban areas where connected cars and smart buildings and civilians with their smart shoes and smart watches are sharing the same mobile towers. So you need to be able to do some smart things um, on the mobile network to make sure you can get the mission critical drone through in congested areas. Um, that's where beam forming and network slicing comes into play. So what network do you think I'm going to recommend uh, for this one? Now, without being able to ask you for a show of hands, um, the answer I already gave in the first slide, it's, it's 5G. So have a, have a think for a second. When you think of 5G, people often don't ask the most important question which is, what does the G stand for in 5G? So I'm wondering if anyone out there knows what the G actually stands for. I might be interested to hear that in the, in the Q&A at the end. To save you from the suspense, the G is actually the fifth generation of mobile network technologies. So a little bit of history on the mobile network. You know, 1G was all about calling. 2G brought in voice and SMS. Um, 3G was the foundation of mobile broadband, so getting news on your phone, um, whereas 4G brought about the revolution of um, evolved mobile video, so being able to have rich content uh, like memes and, and YouTube and, and Netflix, which turned from a DVD delivery company to, a, as we know it today, a video streaming company um, during 4G. But now everyone has a phone, well, almost everyone. Uh, everyone on here on API Day today, I'm assuming, has a phone. Um, but it's not just about phones anymore. So the 4G network is great for what we've had in the past, but to prepare for that you know, future of Internet of Things, um, for you know all these smart lights, smart cars, all these devices that are more than a phone, um, that's where the fifth generation comes into play. So we're looking at things like sub-millisecond latency, double-digit gigabits per second downloads over the air, things that have never been seen before that we're going to take for granted in 10 years' time, just like we take you know, 4G for granted now. Um, and the, the road to 5G is long and winding, full of different dependencies like network frequency and, you know, where the mobile towers are, um, you know, the kind of devices that you have. So people that bring out the 5G devices. It's also about the packet core, you know, non-standalone versus standalone 5G networks. If you guys are interested, we can talk about that in the Q&A. But it's just important to think of 5G as an evolution that's being built upon you know, as we go. Um, and this photo was actually taken at the Telstra 5G Innovation Centre on the Gold Coast, where I spent the last two years there, where we launched um, Australia's first 5G network. Anyway, so what will 5G enable? Um, that's there's the the screen I've got here uh, shows the three key differentiators for 5G. So it's bandwidth, it's speed, and it's capacity. So when we talk about bandwidth, we're talking about enhanced mobile broadband. When we're talking about latency, it's that ultra-reliable, low-latency communication. So really quick reaction times are specifically important in things like telemedicine, autonomous vehicles, and things like that. Um, and the last one, which is related to the Internet of Things, is that capacity of the network. Massive machine-to-machine -machine communications, you know, um, millions of devices per square kilometre that's going to be unlocked. So that scale of connectivity is what's going to enable the Internet of Things. Um, yeah, so there's a few use cases up there. Uh, I might talk about those a little bit later, but I think we all know what we hope that 5G is going to bring. What I do want to say, though, is that 5G is not magic. 
5G removes bottlenecks in speed, bandwidth and capacity on wireless mobile connections. Guaranteed, that's great. But these bottlenecks may still exist in other parts of your end-to-end -end ecosystem. That's why you need to be able to optimize for now for your current systems uh, using things like cloud computing, um, edge, edge processing, artificial intelligence, next generation devices and open APIs, and just making sure your code is really efficient in the first place. So putting 5G on the end of your system is not going to make your code any more efficient or your website load any faster if the back end is still ridiculous. So that's just something to remember. Um, but, you know, with edge compute powered by open API access, we can really enable the next wave of use cases and value creation that 5G is going to bring. Um, and I actually watched, um, hopefully you guys saw it too, the New South Wales Health Pathology talk yesterday. Um, so they were talking about a, a concept of digital proximity. So the idea that even if you're standing next to each other in a connected ambulance or in a pop-up COVID clinic, if you're serving patients on an iPad, you are not really next to them if your servers are in a cloud in Singapore or at your hospital, you know, in Bendigo, right? So you need to make sure that that digital proximity is reduced as much as possible doing things like edge compute so that you can really make the most of that um, 5G last mile. Um, so that's just sort of a integration concept. So I touched on two different uh, networks that are going to enable the Internet of Things. So there was the low power LP WAN networks. So they're sitting down here, uh, blah, blah, blah. They're those kind of examples. Um, and then the other example was the blistering speed and scale of 5G that's scaling up performance. And there's a couple of use cases there. And uh, Telstra has a wide range of network technologies, each with their own suitability. So I only talked about two today. There's so many more to talk about, including some of our complementary technologies, but just wanted to leave that there for you guys to think about. Remember, 5G isn't the answer to everything, uh, but I don't want to confuse you. Um, I don't want to confuse you too much, but 5G can also be um, related to the Internet of Things, LP WAN technologies as well. So um, maybe that's a little bit of background reading for you guys that um, 5G has actually been introduced into the standards of LTE and, and narrowband IoT. So when you hear cool things like network slicing, software defined networks, network optimization, IoT is going on that road with 5G as well. So that means it's really good for your, your investments in these technologies. Um, yeah, so the trade off is you don't have this high bandwidth when you're down there. I'll leave that for now. And moving on to the third part, which is the accessibility of these IoT networks via APIs. So we heard about it in yesterday's keynote with Mike that IoT networks are there to draw the insights um, from the APIs are there to draw insights from IoT networks to access that data securely. Of course, we want to use APIs. And I won't talk too much more about that because you guys are API day experts and you already, already know. Um, but what I will mention is the APIs in the value chain. Um, so I'll give you an example. Here at Telstra Dev, we sell the track and monitor um, IoT devices. And they're really cool because they come with the complete managed service. You have your own dashboard that comes with it. And it's all great off the shelf product. Uh, but we found that, you know, for an example like this, a customer might come to us and they might already have thousands of IoT devices all over the world, all over the country, right? They already have their own dashboard that integrates um, all these other APIs and all these other different systems. So they don't want a new, you know, off the shelf dashboard. They want to be able to get their own data and expose that via API into their existing dashboard. So that's where we've brought things like the track and monitor API, um, where you can actually take the important data from your device, integrate it into existing systems. So this is where I think that, um, you know, as a network provider, Telstra can really add value into the Internet of Things um, by having that at the same time, having the end to end off the shelf solution, but also being able to give like the bespoke raw ingredients like APIs. Um, and we're almost time for questions. So what I will do is just mention this last point about um, APIs, which is the emerging network exposure APIs. So um, I've just got a quote there from Ericsson because Ericsson are really experts in this stuff. Um, but with the example I just gave with the IoT API was about extracting the data. So we've got quite a few examples of that with our um, connected SIM. Uh, we've also got a new API for smart spaces. Um, but here is not about the data, it's about the services that the network has in the background that can be exposed via APIs. So I've seen some really cool stuff from Ericsson in like dynamic network slicing already across 4G and 5G callers. 
um, but for cellular IoT networks, um, when we can expose the service capabilities, um, you can really do some amazing things for managing devices. So I've got a couple of these very quick examples there for machine communications um, in regards to network exposure APIs. You've got non-IP data delivery, which is a lightweight machine-to-machine -machine protocol that will allow those less overhead. So, you know, we've spoken to, spoken to customers who say that, you know, they can only afford to send a couple of kilobytes every hour because their battery needs to last for 10 years, right? They want to do something like this where you're really reducing the overheads and like the, the network provider packages that up um, in what they're sending rather than what you're sending. Not IP data delivery. There's also event monitoring. So if the network can tell you the connection status of your device rather than you finding out a month later that you know your device hasn't been connected. Um, and then there's more advanced features like quality of service um, where I just saw an example from Ericsson where they had a drone um, that you could toggle between focusing on latency, so you could be um, sending data in near real time, or you could toggle between high bandwidth, so you wanted to capture you know, higher fidelity in the drone camera footage. So they're just a couple of examples of not just data exposure via APIs, but service exposure via APIs, and that's where the telcos like Telstra um, will play a really big part. So that's something else that's, that's emerging to put on your radar. Um, yeah, so I, I will just round up by mentioning Telstra Dev. So it is the API and IoT marketplace uh, for Telstra. We've got those end-to-end -end IoT solutions, like I said, um, and a big community where I really want to hear from you guys. You know, I mentioned a couple of APIs, but what APIs do you want to see um, on our portal that Telstra as a service provider can um, can unlock? So I mentioned the Tracker Monitor API um, for you know, giving you information about your devices that are in the field. We've got the Connected Things API, which um, is about getting the connectivity information from the SIMs in your IoT devices. And we've got this new Smart Secure Spaces API for enterprise. Um, I think it's building, tracking, and things like that, but that one's quite a new one. Um, we've also got some tutorials on there. I guarantee you won't have as fun as I do going through the tutorials. That's me with my first um, IoT API tutorial. So. Yeah, we have lots of fun with that. All right, I think I've got a good, I've got a good chunk of that out of the way. So I have the last seven minutes or so um, for questions. Um, what I will just lastly mention, um, if you guys want to stay more part of the conversation with Internet of Things, um, you can join the Meetup group um, Oz IoT, so formerly Melb IoT, but we added in the Australia um, spin really recently. So you can find that at Oz IoT on Meetup. Um, and also straight after this, I'll be joining IBM in a roundtable with developer Steve to talk more about um, this sort of concept about developing with the Internet of Things and um, the software side of things. So yeah, please, um, yeah, I'd love to see you at Oz IoT. I'd love to see you at the roundtable after this. But we have the next five minutes or so to go through some questions. So I might uh, stop sharing my screen. And uh, looks like Dan is back, back here to facilitate some questions with us. Yes, except that there are no questions uh, oh, from the chat. So I hope uh, right. I hope uh, <laughs> people realize that I forgot to remind maybe at the beginning of the session that people can answer, ask questions in the chat if you have any. Uh, but uh, we'll keep an eye out. Uh, I'll keep an eye on that uh, right now. But at the moment, I'll come up with one of my own, uh, yeah, sure. which isn't um, which isn't really uh, an, an IoT specific question, but it relates to five G. Mm -hmm. uh, as the, as we know that this you know incredible bandwidth is coming and and stuff like that. That when um, as you mentioned. Uh, you know the applications, of course, still have to perform well, but the reverse is also true in the sense that if there's an expectation that are people going to come on this 5G network, which has this great bandwidth, they may start developing applications that really require that incredible performance. But not everybody's going to have a 5G device yet. And what would be your advice in terms of if you are architecting solutions? What, what would you expect to be a realistic time frame? to expect that people will have that capacity on their devices? Or or, in, or would you just suggest that people devi design their applications so that it can accommodate both levels of performance? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's something that um, you know we've been asked quite a bit as well by you know innovators like universities and startups and whatnot. You know, 5G isn't available. What am I meant to do with that? But I might just share this slide that I've prepared earlier. Um, so firstly, with 5G, it's important to know that it is, I guess, an evolution. And we have launched 5G, Telstra has launched 5G over a year ago now. 
Um, and I've just got up on the slide here, kind of like the road to 5G. Um, so we're sort of sitting here at the moment where 5G is launched. You can go out and buy a mobile handset um, that can connect to the 5G network. There's not really other many devices, you know, like you know, virtual reality headsets or cars that are 5G enabled yet. Um, so that's sort of on the device ecosystem side. Um, and we're also relying still on the 4G core network. So there's the concept of non-standalone 5G and standalone 5G. So at the moment, um, all of the, the 5G network is still based on the bare bones of the 4G network. So that means that you can go out today, start trialing on 4G, start trialing on with whatever you've got, prove the concept. Like I said, in making sure that your end-to-end -end, you know, digital um, ecosystem is, is optimized. So looking into things like cloud computing, edge computing, um, what else did we say? Yeah, using like really efficient coding so that when 5G is on that last mile, that, that you know, that last mile connectivity, then you're really gonna be able to make the most of it. And until we get to this sort of end state, you know, sub millisecond latency, 20 gigabits per second, um, we're gonna need a few more things like, yeah, more, more frequency on, on the network. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's not a build it and they will come. It's build it because we know that it's coming. And I've already had a couple of, you know, innovative universities and startups and um, industry partners come to us and say they want to work on 5G. Um, so that's what the 5G Innovation Center is actually for. So down on the Gold Coast, you can actually um, reach out to those guys or I can help you reach out to them um, to, to look into future use cases for 5G. So yeah, definitely you don't have to wait to start building, building 5G use cases. And I think, um, if you look back at the history of mobile networks as well, not that I've been around for all of them, um, but it's kind of like it's, the telco is not going to be the one inventing all these amazing things that you're going to be using the network for. It's, I mentioned Netflix. So Netflix was a DVD delivery company that sort of saw the 4G network and thought, oh, actually, I can pivot and start you know, streaming rather than delivering DVDs. So we're sort of the reason why Telstra has launched 5G first in Australia and also one of the first in the world. So we were the third country in the world to have 5G is that we do want to have people starting early and, and innovating on, on the 5G network. So yeah, I hope that kind uh, of answers the question. Yes, it does. And uh, now we've got a couple of questions that have come in. So uh, Jessica Charlesworth asks, what's been the uptake and feedback on the IoT devices so far? Um, so do you mean, uh, IoT in general. So in terms of uptake, I know that Telstra has over 3 million devices connected to our IoT network. So traditionally we've been focusing on the connectivity, right? So Telstra is the mobile provider, we sell the SIMs and you can put those IoT SIMs in whatever device you have. So I don't really have insight on uptake of the actual devices out there. Um, yeah, so millions of devices on the IoT network. I think maybe the, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Okay, good. The next uh, next question, we got one minute left, is uh, security best practices for IoT. I don't know if you can answer that in one minute. But. <laughs> yeah, uh, my quick answer is you need to have it be secure at every single point in your IoT deployment, right? So on the device level, having things like inbuilt certifications um, that can do security protocols on your device level, making sure wherever you're storing the information or sending the information in the cloud, that's secure as well, using best practices there. But then across the network too, you know, the, the networks I talked about today were all standardized cellular IoT networks. They have inherent security built into them um, for things like you know, Wi-Fi, Sigfox, unstandardized technologies. They don't have the security, um, I guess, uh, the security that you would get from a standardized network. Um, uh, there's also issues about congestion and things like that on the unstandardized network. So if you're connecting your home and you've got your smart lights on Wi-Fi, I think that's okay. Um, but you know, if you're going to be connecting driverless cars, um, you wouldn't be using Wi-Fi as like an inherently in, like not a secure network. So that's my one minute on best practices of security with IoT. And you wrap that up pretty well in one minute. That's awesome. Good timing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thanks great for the question, talk, Jason. Michelle. We we might let you get uh, scurry off to your roundtable discussion right now. If anybody here has any more questions for Michelle, I'm sure you can join her in that roundtable, and uh, it'd be great. But thank you very much, really? Michelle. We'll uh, we'll get ready for our next uh, next presentation. Thanks, guys, so much. Enjoy your API days.